Good morning from the IRM in London. Welcome to this webinar about the IRM's work and qualifications and how these are relevant to military and service personnel. Today we're going to look at how some organizations and individuals in the military sector have been making use of our qualifications to boost their expertise in risk management. And we're also going to go through the practicalities of how the enrollment and the study process work. My name is Carolyn Williams. I'm the Director of Corporation, uh, Corporate Relations here at the IRM. I took the IRM examinations myself many years ago, so I know very well how it feels to be wondering what the course involves, how it's going to meet business needs and progress your career, and how you're going to be able to fit it into a busy work and family life. First, let's deal quickly with some technical points. If you've got sound problems, then I'm afraid it's likely to be a problem at your end with the speed of your internet connection. There isn't anything that we can do or tweak or help you in real time. However, you'll be able to access the recording of the webinar after it finishes, so you can catch up later. If you've got any questions as we go along, then type them into the question box, and we'll see how many we can deal with in the time we have available at the end. The IRM website is also a mine of further information. You'll find the syllabus information for all the qualifications and details of enrollment and examinations on there. <clears throat> We've got a number of people who are scheduled to join this webinar from all over the world today. Um, and because IRM's uh, qualifications and courses are designed for distance learning, We've got students in many different countries. Every year we have about 500 students studying with us on all our various courses. Our courses are actually sector dependent. Risk management tools and techniques can be applied whatever sector you work in. However, there is a particular affinity between the service and risk management. This applies not only to those in service roles, but also to the type of employment that people seek and the skills that they take with them when they leave the services. Last year, the IRM signed the UK Armed Forces Covenant to reflect our intention to raise the visibility of risk management as a professional skill for service personnel and also to support career transition. Among our 8,000 members and students from around the world, we have a good representation from a number of armed forces, as shown here on the slide. We also have strong representation in the public sector in general as effective enterprise risk management and building healthy risk cultures becomes increasingly important to government departments, public sector bodies of all types around the world. So next slide shows our agenda for today. I'm going to talk to you a bit about why people take professional qualifications, the sort of things a risk professional needs to know, and about the perfect progression route through the qualifications. Then we're going to hear from some people with a service connection who have followed that route and who now work in risk along with a recruitment expert on the transition from military to civilian careers. We're also going to hear from an IRM module coach and a member of our student support team about the practicalities of getting a qualification. Next slide. So, why take a professional qualification? And why would IRM? First, we're not a training company or a consultancy. IRM is an independent, not-for-profit body owned and run by its members who are all practicing risk professionals in some form. Secondly, we're not a university or a college. That's not to say we don't work closely with the academic world. Our qualifications are developed by a mixed team of academics and people actually working in risk. So they give you a great balance of academic rigor and practical application. As well as giving you the subject knowledge you need, qualifying with IRM gives you an internationally recognized professional qualification with letters after your name. In that way, we're similar to other professional bodies that you may encounter, for example, the Project Management Institute, Engineering Institute, or similar for accountants or internal auditors. Belonging to an institute like IRM also provides you with a network that will support your lifelong career and your learning opportunities. Next slide, please. As, as you might expect, IRM has some views on what makes a good risk professional and how qualifications and membership support professional excellence. Um, we, we think the people working within risk management, they need to have a technical knowledge about, uh, about risk management, about the frameworks and processes and standards. On top of that, they also need to know how risk management in their particular sector works. So whether you're in, you're in financial services, whether you're in the infrastructure sector, you need to know about specific techniques and, and how, how risk management within that sector. 
Um, risk, man risk professionals also need to know how the risk profession fits in with other professionals. So how risk works with HR, how risk works with internal audits, how you work with the information security people. You also need to know about your own organization, you know, how it works, the culture in respect to risk, um, how things are done around there. And lastly, you need to have some self-knowledge. Uh, risk professionals need to be able to have a, a sh very sharp communication skills. They also have to be skilled at influencing, negotiating, and questioning. And developing yourself as a professional through the whole path with IRM gives you opportunities to develop all these aspects of a, a professional career. The slide that's just going up now, which is a, a sort of a career ladder slide, and this shows how people progress through the IRM's qualifications. Many people come to us there at the bottom of the ladder. Uh, they might do some training with us. Um, we have a fundamentals of risk management course that we deal that we've delivered around the world to thousands of people. Uh, a two-day course gives you an introduction to what this thing called risk management is all about. Or people might find us on on the internet. Uh, I myself many years ago googled risk management training and ended up with the Institute of Risk Management. So once people have become interested and they decide they actually want to get a qualification, they want some letters after their name that show uh, the world and show their employers. Uh, current and future, that they know what they're talking about when it comes to risk management. The first option is to take the International Certificate in Risk Management, which is either available either as a general version or a specific one for financial services. Uh, that takes around about a year to take, um, and it, it is, operates at roughly first year undergraduate level. Um, after people have taken the certificate, they can have the letters IRM cert after their name. Moving on from the certificate, people who really enjoy risk management and, and want to get to the, the ultimate qualification can move on to IRM's international diploma. That involves a further two years of study. Uh, there's some flexibility over it because it's, uh, uh, we recognize that people are working uh, and, and trying to do other things at the same time, so uh, people can take different modules over, over a different period of time. But once people have taken the international diploma, that takes their study up to a master's level. Um, it brings in um, more sophisticated study techniques and a more in-depth look at uh, all aspects of risk management. Once people pass their, their diploma, then they can call them they they can call themselves uh, a member of the Institute of Risk Management because they can then move on to certified status. Uh, certification involves us bringing together a look at your experience, um, your qualifications, which in, which um, usually is the, the IRM uh, diploma. But it also requires you, as a member of the Institute, to undertake continuing professional development and also to abide by our Code of Ethics. So if you get the letters CMIRM, which means Certified Member of the Institute of Risk Management, or CFIRM, which is for people who've been around and participating in risk management for a few more years, um, Certified Fellow of the Institute of Risk Management, if you see those letters after people's names, you know that they are a certified risk professional and they have gone through this process both qualifications and experience and the uh, a commitment to lifelong learning. So that's how the uh, <coughs> qualifications all fit together and that's the career ladder that people will climb. So now we're going to start by, we're going to hear from some experts about their experience and how all these things apply to people in the military. Now, do we have Ben Adams on the line from Broadgate? Hi, yes, I'm here. Hi, Ben. All right, good, Hi, good yeah. morning, Ben. Good to hear from you morning. today. Now, Ben, yes. you're a specialist recruitment expert, and you're going to talk to uh, people about the transition from a military career into a civilian career and how risk management might indeed be a very transferable skill. So over to you, Ben. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, just, just briefly on me. So I, I run a, a recruitment company called Broadgate Search. We've got offices in London, Manchester, and Dublin. Um, I mean, my background actually has always been uh, recruiting in, in risk, um, you know, all the way up from risk analysts to, to chief risk officers. Um, and now I've got a business now of, of 40 consultants and we focus on all areas of governance. So not just pure risk management, but compliance, information security, data protection, uh, audit, uh, compliance, financial crime. So, um, so yeah, uh, uh, let, me, let me kick off with... Um, some some, uh, some differentiations between different positions that you can have within uh, your risk career, uh, and then I'll link that to how you know I feel that uh, that that skills which you can transition from having in the military 
Um, and then I'm going to talk briefly about, um, you know, kind of a live example of, of someone that we've worked with um, who's transitioned from the military into civil street to find a job in uh, in risk. So, um, so first of all, you know, you need to you need to think about, you know, you need to analyse yourself, I guess, and you need to work out whether or not you're looking at getting into uh, quantitative risk um, or qualitative risk. I guess the, the main difference of um, those two areas is are you are you analytical? Do you know do you have some financial acumen uh, background or or do you not? Um, there's 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 positions for you in risk which are you know operational focused or very financial. So you know you can look at you can look at either either side of the coin. The types of um, job that you can get into so job roles you know types of um, specifications i would advise you to research so you can start looking at what's essential and desirable from from clients and um, uh, prospective employers would be uh, corporate governance roles uh, information security risk enterprise risk management uh, regulatory risk operational uh, and techno technology risk uh, all, all these areas are in, in huge demand uh, they are candidate short markets. So, you know, once you qualify in a certain area of these risks, you are, uh, you know, very likely to get a job in the industry. I think what's, what's great about uh, risk as well and, and, and what's great about the IRM um, is that it, it goes across all sectors. Um, you know, we, we as a business are quite heavily focused towards uh, the regulated sectors um, and, and financial services being our core area, but it, you know it spreads across all all areas of, 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 uh, of the sectors, which is great. Um, types of uh, skills that are transferable. So these are the types of um, uh, skills that you need to be thinking about. Um, that, that you know, do, am I am I like that in the military at the moment, or, or you know, are they, are they key skills of mine? So you know, a lot of these will be given, you know, because of, because of uh, what you've been doing. But uh, I'll run through them now. So uh, working under under extreme stress, uh, not only that, but being able to stay calm and make calculated decisions, uh, being able to cope with cope with change, negotiating skills, uh, being able to influence others uh, within a business, regardless of, of level. You know, so you, you know, in a risk role, you 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 tend to speak to all areas and all, all, all stakeholders within a business. Communication skills need to be key. Strategic thinking. Um, this is a great one. I think you know trans transferable skills in the military. Understand the understanding of rules and regulations. Um, so you know transferring that into a working environment is, is is really important. So we found that we've had some great success from from, from people that come out of the military transferring uh, into a risk role, having that understanding. Um, and then yeah, being able to uh, network. So. You know, this links now into how, you know, much some advice for me, you know, if, if you're looking at finding that first job in risk or looking to progress your risk career, um, is, is get yourself out into networking events. Um, and how can you find them? You know, you, you can find them on social media platforms like LinkedIn, um, you know, follow Broadgate Search and follow Ex-Military Careers, which is our social enterprise for upcoming events. Um, for, look at websites like Eventbrite, um, uh, the Institute of Risk Management, of course, and other risk uh, academic bodies, and and start to put yourself out there and, and network with these people. Um, you know, the ideal goal at the end of something like that is, of course, to find a job. But in in the uh, in the interim, if you can if you can network with someone and perhaps find a mentor that will support you through, um, that 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 would be that would be excellent. Um, uh, so, so finally, just regards to advice when leaving uh, the military, you're required to give one year's notice. Um, during that time, you're entitled to 30 days resettlement leave and 28 days terminal leave. So, you know, to plan what you're going to do with that time. Um, you know, we, we, we've supported people in the past where we've found them work experience, um, where, you know, that is just an extra line on your CV, on your profile, where, you know, that, that could secure you an interview over you know, someone that, that, that hasn't done that. So spend your time wisely when you, when you get that time off. Um, research the companies and research the qualifications that you want to do in detail. Uh, the stat that was shared that at least 65% of veterans leave their first role in the last 12 months. So it's very important to do as much research as you can to, to find out what you, what you think feel you'd be suitable for, I guess, in terms of your transferable skills. Um, 
and yeah, uh, LCAS support. I know uh, the IOM is uh, going through the process with, with LCAS at the moment, but you know, apply to, to to these types of bodies where you can get some financial support as well to to to, to uh, enhance your studies or or whatnot. So, so yeah, that's that's it. I mean, my, I, I'll still call any questions later in, in the uh, webinar. Feel free to to share. That's great, Ben. Thank you very much. So there is life on the other side, isn't there? And uh, it's always good to see people who, who make that transition successfully. I mean, it's all in the planning and the preparation. So, you know, getting a qualification and you know, finding out much more about the risk industry is an essential step here. Right, I'm now going to hand over to Sarah, who's here with us in London. Uh, Sarah Christman is the risk director for UK and Ireland Equifax and TDX Group. She's also on our IRM board of directors here. And she's based here in the UK, but as you'll hear, she has a more global background, including a spell in the US Navy. Uh, Sarah is a certified member of IRM, which means she has gone through this process and uh, obtained our diploma. So Sarah, over to you. Tell us about your experience, uh, uh, how you find uh, your risk career. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. So from driving ships to managing risks. I've lost counts of how many people have commented on what a leap that must have been. But I don't grow weary of it. Instead, I seize the opportunity to share more about what it means to serve in the military and the strength of the culture for risk-taking that exists in the military. Starting with the more mundane aspects of life in the U.S. Navy, the planned maintenance system known as PMS, anticipating what might break, on what frequency it's likely to break, and performing regularly scheduled preventive, detective, or corrective activities to make the ship more resilient. Sounds an awful lot like risk management to me. Moving to the more strategic aspects of life as a sailor, one of my jobs was to plan how we would land Marines on the beach, brief my shipmates, and supervise the landing from the Combat Information Center. One of the tricky bits was ensuring that any planes dropping bombs on the beach stopped before the Marines land, but not too long before the Marines land. Working out where opportunity becomes threat and planning for how you'll strike a balance between the two. Well, that sounds an awful lot like risk management to me too. This year, I've been out of the Navy for as long as I was in. I'm at a career stage where the IRM's newest publication, How to Hire a Great Chief Risk Officer, is helping to shape my personal development plan. The paper describes 10 competencies a great CRO should exhibit. Four of those 10 are technical skills that you can acquire through IRM qualifications. You might need years of practical experience to hone the other six behavioral skills before you're on the short list for a CRO role. But nailing those technical skills along the way, that's what's going to give you a firm foundation and confidence in your experience. What made studying with the IRM so valuable to me is that I picked up tools and practices that I could put to use at work right away. I didn't need to wait years to do what the coursework said to do. I only needed to wait a few hours. IRM certifications do require hard work, and that hard work takes time, but it is so much more worth your time when you get those instant gratification moments that I could do this tomorrow moment. And if you aren't already in the habit of looking outside your organization for new ideas, pursuing a qualification gives you an ideal reason to start doing so. Whilst I was studying, I found new people to follow on LinkedIn, new sites for webinars, and my personal favorite, new podcasts for my walk to work. Having an IRM certification adds to my credibility at work. I do work closely with our audit, compliance, security, and IT departments, all of whom have certifications in their area of expertise. I can stand side by side with them, confident that my knowledge of risk tools, techniques, and best practices has been tested and proven. As a director, I do have a team of folks that work for me. My team have all completed or are enrolled in training at the certificate level with the IRM as well. I know how rigorous the IRM programs are from my own personal experience. When I see them appear on a CV, I have a good idea how committed this applicant is to the profession and to their personal development. 
continuing participation in the IRM after my certification is key to my way forward professionally. I'm the chair of the Financial Services Special Interest Group. I got involved in the Special Interest Group because I wanted a new source of ideas about risk management and specific to my industry. The SIG, as we call it, has been a great source of learning and a fantastic networking opportunity. We've hosted events on topics ranging from artificial intelligence and blockchain to conduct risk and crisis response. I got to meet and subsequently connect on LinkedIn with our panelists from think tanks, universities, banks and building societies, and consulting firms. These were some super smart people that helped me think differently about the threat and opportunity facing financial services. In between events, we connect with each other on WhatsApp. It's been a fantastic channel when you just need a quick benchmark or perhaps an extended debate on some tool or technique. And then some days our WhatsApp chat is a source of wisdom and knowledge, and some days it's a place for a little bit of good-natured banter between colleagues. But the bottom line, being part of what the IRM is doing does pay dividends, and I would recommend it to anyone who's prepared to make the effort to get the most from it. Thank you very much, Sarah. That is absolutely fascinating. Uh, the, the links that you've drawn there are uh, truly amazing. That's good. Um, do we have Simon King on the line? Uh, yes, I'm here, Karen. You can Fantastic. hear me. Simon, hi. Good morning, Simon. Now, Simon is also a certified member, like Sarah, and uh, you're Chief Risk Officer at the UK Ministry of Defence here in London. And uh, Simon's also held previous risk roles at major organisations, including Heathrow Airport. So, Simon, I'm going to hand over to you now, and if you can give me you know, your account of um, your life in risk. Okay. Um, it doesn't sound anywhere near as exciting as what I've just listened to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I consider my desk driving exemplary. Um, so I've been um, in the MOD for the last four and a half years, but I'm basically doing the same job that I've done for the last 15 or so years. Um, my job for that time has been about board level uh, listed company corporate risk, applying the common principles to get me invited to have opinions on different types of risk, whether it's commercial risk, financial risk, safety risk. Um, you know, I've got different levels of practical experience in these things from the, the different jobs and projects I've been involved in. Um, but I'm a professional risk practitioner. I practice risk. I'm a professional generalist in the department. Um, why have I been doing the same thing for so long? Well, there's a few other jobs that I think could give me quite the same reach across, up and down an organisation or give me the opportunity to influence and expose me me to so many different challenges. So I've always said to people that if you want true variety, scope and freedom in your work, then get into a risk career. But there's no free lunch. There's no, I've had times when you know, I've been responsible for risk frameworks in listed companies and I've had chief exec, executives explain to me my share of the responsibility were the company's share price to be dropped. Um, even though I wasn't on anywhere near the same pay pack as they were, but that was the responsibility that they placed on me. So while I've tried not to ever build an overly inflated sense of self-importance, um, you do have to have significant personal courage to do this job, to, to recognize the risk associated in judging the internal political battles and which ones are worth having at which time. You know, I recognise that if I get it wrong, if I choose not to raise something at a certain point in time, risk could materialise with significant corporate effects. Decisions and discussions that need to happen in the boardroom or around the executive committee may not happen. And you know, there's one of the characteristics that has served me well is the confidence to ask for feedback from people to be told, actually, when, you, when could you push more, even? It was working at Heathrow Airport that I first actually worked alongside former servicemen and women. And they didn't stand out just for the confidence um, that they exhibited and just for the way that they carried themselves. But there was something different about them in the way that they took decisions and then got things done. Um, 
it was also back at Heathrow that I had most fun leveraging the opportunities of my role because it meant that I could get engaged with our key suppliers. I could visit their operations, their warehouses, their armories, their airframes, their hangars. I could get them to explain their business to me so that I could understand their risks of their delivery from their perspective and how that would affect me and my business at the time so that I could get assurance that Heathrow would be able to continue operating, continue to have stocks on the shelves for duty-free sales, continue to be able to operate safely. Um, it's totally different here. With government commercial arrangements, a major appears so much more complicated and the government can't be seen to be interfering with industry or questioning and improving an individual supplier's resilience. Um, so that hasn't worked as well. But what I have done in the job here is given advice to NATO four stars and allied governments on their risk management approaches. Now, I recognize that some of this is exactly the same as some of the staff roles that, that, that military colleagues have, but as a civilian you in, that's different. Um, most recently, I've helped rewrite the Orange Book, Government's Risk Management Policy. Um, admittedly, that's only exciting you if you're a bit of an egotist and also a bit of a risk geek. Um, I lecture for admittedly only an hour on each course at the Staff Development College that we have here and also on a NATO Building Integrity course. Um, a typical day for me literally is classified, um, but it can range from briefing and questioning ministers on how well they understand things, having very secure conversations on a range of topics, being asked to give a risk lens to them, um, mundanely dealing with staffing issues, but most of my time and where I get most of my buzz is helping people get over their fear of the truth, of their, the limits of their knowledge and getting people to be comfortable with uncertainty and the fact that they may not have perfectly nailed down how they're going to deliver the task they've been given. I have helped a few servicemen and women through their career transition, helping them realize that while not initially appearing comparable to corporate experience, there's so much that they've done that's transferable to the corporate sector. Um, I've also been involved with the IRM for a very long time, as I sort of think back, as mainly attending the special interest groups, as, as I've just been referred to, but also way back in the past, I rewrote and delivered a version of the Fundamentals of this Management Training course. As I reflected preparing for this, it was an element actually of peer pressure from military staff or military colleagues that encouraged me to get IRM qualified after all these years. You know, my career path shows that I am, if I'm allowed to say it, qualified by experience. But there's definitely a reassurance that it gives you, um, as well as being able to demonstrate that what I'm doing is not just good theory, but also good practice. Um, and the military, where as part of your careers in the UK at least, you can end up with one or two degrees and all sorts of qualifications that you pick up. So having something in a practical area that allows the theory to be merged, I think is fantastic. Um, I do recommend IRM qualifications to staff coming into risk roles across the MOD as well, because for me it helps translate the second nature application of military judgment into a business context along with the theory that you've got. And it also gives you confidence to inform corporate decision making and it gives you greater confidence as well, not that you necessarily need it, but to, but to challenge senior, senior leaders and to brief them really meaningfully. We have a project starting up in the MOD uh, shortly to improve risk professionalism in all sorts of roles that will stretch from project managers to cost accountants, planners, those reporting risk and those supporting governments, as well as trying to find the best way of giving training to our most senior staff on risk. Um, that's going to be aligned to work that we're still doing on the Orange Book. Um, my team recently ran a week's course and workshop overseas for a local planning team and their commanders. I ran a risk workshop for the Second Sea Lord the week before last. Um, the meeting I was in just before coming in here was discussing um, the presentation of safety risks in one of the armed services and how I can leverage those opportunities to report things up cent um, centrally. The stuff that I do matters and having the qualifications really adds to your credibility and it definitely helps open doors when you transition out of services. 
some of the things that we do day to day are beyond the realization of normal civilians that haven't worked in defense. If we could only talk about it, I don't think they would necessarily believe the risk-based decisions and the trade-offs and the judgments that we've had to make, all of which achieve military objectives in the past, but actually that's just risk management. What does having an IRM qualification with you when you leave um, defense? Well, as, as a prospective employer, I know what I'd be getting. But for others, surely having an IRM qualification has to help get an interview. It has to give the prospective employer confidence that the examples of decisions and projects you've been able to reference in your CV about the risks you've helped manage are real. And it helps show that you're bringing theory and a wealth of good practical experience to bear for them. Um, just to sort of mirror the comment that we've made just now about the use of online services, for those of you that are within the MOD, um, we've got a growing, developing online risk forum through the new uh, Microsoft Office platforms. If you're not plugged into it, if you want to get plugged into it, uh, look me up on Modnet. Um, I won't say my name and email address out loud now, uh, but look me up on Modnet to get in touch. Um, thank you. That's all I was going to say. That's excellent, Simon. Thank you very much for that very sort of positive account. Uh, I've, there's been a lot of nodding going on in the room here, and Sarah, I think, is, is completely agrees with the, what you said about the role of the risk professional today in, in you know, working within the team. So thank you very much, Simon. Um, I'm now going to hand over to our next speaker, Kate Boothroy. Um, Kate is a long-standing uh, certified fellow of the Institute, and she's an examiner, and she's one of our team of expert trainers who we send around the world delivering courses. Um, she's also a module coach, providing direct guidance to students, and she's going to talk about the structure of our certificate exams. Hi, Kate. Hi. Hi, Carolyn. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, as uh, Carolyn said, I've I've been with the um, IRM now. Um, <laughs> it's 28 years, Carolyn. So, uh, and and a fellow since 1996. So. Um, and I took those exams, just to put it into a little bit of context, I used to be a student um, because I needed letters after my name um, to um, not only prove to prospective clients and, and customers and um, hopefully employers that I, I have some um, knowledge, but uh, that also gave me some confidence too that you know I could take that forward. And in terms of knowledge, in, um, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, modules for the certificate. So I'm a module coach and um, the author of module three, which is the next module into the diploma. But the first two modules, modules one and two, um, give you the, the basics of uh, risk management, a basic understanding. Module one is um, covers six items and it is uh, six units are in there and what it does is it gives you the information on the principles of risk and risk management. Um, it takes you through um, the, the basic concepts, it takes you through standards and regulatory frameworks and one of the problems we find that students have is, is understanding that there isn't just one definition of risk or, or one standard. Um, but we've been talking about the different sectors and industries you can use risk management in and Everybody has to have their own way, I suppose, of doing things. And then the certificate is actually based on the international standard of risk management, which is ISO 31000. So it covers that standard, but it also covers um, the Orange Book, um, which Simon was talking to you about. At the moment, we're still using the 2004 version, uh, but we will be moving on to the new version, which came out last year. Um, but there's other standards um, relating to IT, relating to charities, so it covers lots of different sectors. Then we consider what enterprise risk management is, and that's been talked about by both Sarah and Simon, um, thinking about how you look at risk across an organisation. Um, and then we go into the risk management process. We talk about risk assessment, which includes um, setting objectives, it includes identification analysis, and the evaluation of risks. Um, and then thinking about how we respond and, and treat those risks and, and manage those risks on an ongoing basis. So that gives you the principles. And then the certificate moves on to think about how we put that into practice. So it uh, goes through 
areas such as the global business environment. So we talk about how risks sit in the context of what's going on in the world around us. So we come out of our organisational focus and, and consider what's going on um, both locally, nationally and internationally. So that will certainly pick up some of the points that both Sarah and, and Simon will be considering. Um, we also think about how um, you develop a risk management framework for an organisation. So we, we consider the, the architecture and the strategy and the protocols that are needed um, to help support risk management across an organisation. We do also take into account the uh, culture and the appetite and the tolerance that um, exists within organisations. It's a very key point in making decisions at corporate levels. Um, then we go into corporate governance um, and um, the um, rules that ha organisations have to follow um, and the regulations to make sure that risk management is done effectively and that organisations are running themselves properly and then how risk management um, gives assurance to the board and how we can report to people in a way that is meaningful rather than just going through um, risk registers and lots of risks and then finally it puts it all into context and we take um, into account some case studies so that final unit in module two talks about case studies but actually we follow case studies all the way through so although you have to um, and we jokingly call it have to you have to wear the the essential reading hat so you have to have to learn things in terms of the essential reading we also try to make sure you can put that um, learning into context so as Sarah said, you, you're learning, but then you can take that into your um, real life environment very, very quickly. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, one of the things that we have learned through um, many years of doing um, distance learning, um, which is the way that we uh, do the examinations for the IOM, is that some people struggle a little with um, only having to deal with distance learning. Um, and although you're given lots of support and lots of information, which uh, Lisa is going to take you through in a moment, um, we found it's very helpful uh, for some students to actually give them what we call blended learning. So I think we're probably into our fourth cohort of blended learning um, that's coming up this June. Um, what we've, we've developed, um, and it's only available at the moment in the UK, although we are um, um, taking some train the trainer courses out uh, around the world. Um, what we have developed is some workshops that tie in with um, your learning as a student. So we go into what we call an induction session, um, and that is at the very beginning of the um, the, the, the roadmap for uh, doing the certificate. Um, and that's a one day session where we actually meet you face to face as students. Uh, we go through the unit, we talk about um, how you can study, uh, what's expected of you, and some notes from the module coaches and from the IRM on, on what um, you're going to be examined on and, and how best to study. And then we provide um, two what we call mid-programme workshops, which are in the middle of the study period. And it's generally two days, and we take you through uh, modules one and module two. So on those uh, module one on day one, module two on day two, and um, we go through each of the units in more detail, uh, each of the modules in more detail, and the six units within those in more detail. Um, and we, we help you understand the material, how it links together. We um, go through the essential reading, the study guides, um, and we take you through the journey of risk management in terms of the modules, but then we also try to put it in terms of your practical application. And then finally, there's a one-day uh, seminar workshop that is held nearer to the exams, uh, we review your learning of those um, modules um, and we then consider the exam techniques and we practice the um, exam sample exam papers and and hopefully give you an idea of, of what you're going to face when you take an exam. So the distance learning does hold you by the hand and take you through, through things very um, helpfully, very clearly. But the, just, the blended learning also then um, help some students who need that face-to-face -face interaction and I'm one of the um, currently three of the um, trainers who take you through that so we've developed the material and we know the material inside out and we um, 
we found that students who can um, manage to get on the blending learning have a, a slight advantage because they have that face-to-face -face, um, interaction with people who know the material. So I, I hope that gives you an idea of what the certificate gives you. Um, obviously, that's your starting um, point on, on your education. That's great. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, I, I think that uh, outlines the sort of things you're going to learn uh, and how we go about uh, teaching it. We have also have here with us um, Lucas Moraes from IRM Student Support Team. Lucas is part of the team that guides our students from their enrolment right through their studies and exams and hopefully on into qualified IRM membership. Uh, he's going to talk about the practical details of how to enroll for the certificate and the logistical arrangements of studying and taking the exam. Over to you, Lucas. Well, good morning, everyone. We talked about the great benefits of having an IRM qualification, and you might be asking yourself, where do I start? So the first step is to visit our website and complete the online enrollment. We are still taking applications for our June 2020 exams, but the deadline is this Friday, 31st of January. If that's too close, there's nothing to worry about. We will open our enrollment window for our December 2020 exams immediately after, on the 1st of February. After enrolling, you can start your studies on our online platform, which I'll talk about in a minute. We recommend 180 to 200 hours of study per module. That depends on your work-life balance and available time. The good thing about our qualifications is that you can make your own plans to study whenever is best for you. You might be asking yourself, what are the exams like? So each module is assessed by a 90-minute computer-based exam, and each exam has 60 questions. The exam dates are different, one week apart, one week apart from each other for modules one and two. Um, we have exam centers available worldwide, and the exam results are available six weeks after the exam date. After that, you'll hopefully become an IRM cert and join our global membership community. But if you need to retake your exams for any reason, you get three attempts to each module. Now let's talk about the support of it available for you while you are studying. Um, so when you enroll, you get one year of student membership for free, and that gives you access to our resource center. You can join our special interest and regional groups, and, and also have discounted prices on IRM training and CPD activities. Uh, you get detailed study guides, so each module will have a detailed study guide to help you prepare for the exam. Uh, you get core text study books. Uh, those are included in your course fee and you will be sent to you uh, on an electronic version. Um, you, can all, you will also get student support. Uh, our student support team is available Monday to Friday, 9 to 5 UK time, to help you with any queries you might have. Uh, we also do some practice exams. Uh, we provide exam, uh, specimen exam papers um, so that you get familiar with the exam format. And finally, we have uh, online tutorials and webinars. So throughout the course, we have three webinars which are included in a course fee, an induction webinar, mid-program webinar, and a revision webinar, um, where your module coach will give you guidance and support you uh, throughout, throughout your studies. And we also have a discussion forum where you can ask your module coach uh, some questions and network with other students. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Lucas. Well, we're coming up to the end of our allotted time for the webinar here today. So I'd just like to thank all our speakers um, who have joined us and for sharing their knowledge and their experience. Uh, don't forget, everybody, you can access the recording of this webinar if you want to hear it all over again, or if you want to recommend it to a colleague who you think, it might, be in, uh, who you think might be interested. And take a look at the IRM website for more information about the course and about enrollment. Um, we didn't take, have any time to deal with questions um, on the webinar today, but we have an inquiries team here at IRM who are more than happy to deal with any questions you may have, either by email or by phone. So we hope we'll be welcoming you know, many more people from the military and from the service personnel uh, as students and members of the IRM soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.